This is going to be the most important presentation you are going to see for the next five years. Why? Because this is not about GDPR. This is not about advertising. This is not about media. This is about life and death. This is about the life and death of brands. This is about a fundamental, epochal change in the way brands are born, the way they grow up, and the way they die. I'm about to describe to you original research that shows that we are in the middle of a change in the way things happen that is as significant as the Industrial Revolution itself. And we call this how to create a 21st century brand. I'm going to uh, uh, talk quite a lot about trends in the United States. I'm going to bring it home in a European context as well. I promise you that. Um, you've probably seen a number of these companies. Uh, or you know a number of these companies. Warby Parker in um, eyeglasses. Uh, Glossier in cosmetics. Casper in uh, mattresses. And you probably think about these companies as, if you think about them at all, as interesting curiosities in individual categories. But I am here to tell you and to prove to you that these are not merely interesting curiosities, that they actually represent, these companies represent an enduring shift in the way the consumer economy itself operates. If you are a longtime successful incumbent, these are the companies that are challenging your future, but they're also illuminating a path to your future. If you are not a brand, if you're in the support structure for brands, if you're a publisher, if you're a platform, if you're a technology company, if you're a data company, this is also your future business. The thing that I need to start with, because this really is about brands, and all of our businesses are about brands, and the way I want to start is by saying that if you are an incumbent brand in most consumer categories, where you are today, right now, is in crisis. But in order to describe the crisis, I want to describe to you what's actually preceded for the past 100 years. This is a description of what we call the indirect brand economy. This is where we have lived for about the past 130, almost 140 years. We date it to 1879. That's the year that Procter & Gamble invented ivory soap, and pretty much the moment that uh, the consumer economy came into existence. And what this shows is that during this 130-year period, there was fundamentally only one way for companies to create value, consumer-facing brands. They created value through the ownership and operation of a high barrier to entry, capital-intensive supply chain. What that means is they owned or significantly controlled every major function within their supply chain, from the sourcing of raw materials to logistics to production, all the way through to distribution. And there is so much power inherent in that owned and operated supply chain that companies could afford to go through a very kind of clunky, opaque form of value extraction, which involved a series of third-party handoffs. The first handoff is from the brand to the advertising agency. Why? Because if you go back 100 years in history, advertising agencies owned all the competitive pricing information for the media. That's really the, the, the origin of the modern advertising agency. The agencies then had to do another handoff. They went to a publisher. Why? Because publishers owned all the access to the consumers. There was no way, no way to get to consumers without going through the, uh, the intermediary of publishers. Publishers would get to the consumer, but then they would have to do yet one more third-party handoff. They would have to go to a third-party retail store. Why? Because 
in all of our developed economies, virtually all sales for the past century were fulfilled in third-party retail stores. In the United States, as re which is my reference point here, uh, as recently as 1992, uh, almost 96 to 97 percent of all consumer sales occurred in a physical retail store. Only about three or four percent occurred outside of stores through telephone solicitations, door-to-door -door selling, uh, catalogs, mail order. Um, in the United States in 1992, to give you a reference point, the total retail economy was two trillion dollars. Only three to four percent of it, as I said, took place outside of stores. The non-store retail economy was about a $60 billion business. Keep that in mind, because it's going to come back. This, this process of the owned and operated high barrier to entry supply chain combined with this form of third party value extraction was extraordinarily powerful. This is a famous chart. Uh, it uh, uh, originated as a uh, Harvard study. And what it shows is that in 25 consumer facing categories in the United States, the number one brands in 1923, in 19 of those categories, the number one brand in 1923 was the number one brand in 1983. The number one brands were so powerful because of these value creation and extraction mechanisms and their ability to dominate them that they remained in number one position for 60 years. That's how powerful it was to dominate your supply chain. Now, what's changed over the past five or six years since the last recession is that growth has significantly slowed or stopped in virtually every single consumer facing category. This is true in the United States. It's, through, uh, it's true as well through most of Europe. Uh, just to give you a sense of what this is, again, numbers. GDP growth in the United States from 1947 through 2017 averaged 3.21% annually. In the first quarter of this year, GDP growth was 2.3%. So GDP growth right now significantly lags behind the historic post-World War II average. And yet, as you look at this chart, you'll see that every category, with the exception of the top three, is lagging even that poor GDP growth. Most brands in most categories are suffering. Their leadership, their dominance for 60 years has now come to a very, very difficult point. Underneath those headlines are some other striking, profound changes. One of them, and I know this is a difficult to read chart, but it's very important. The biggest change that's happening is that what little growth is actually occurring is not, no longer occurring in physical retail stores. It is occurring in other channels, primarily non-store channels, which means digital channels today. I mentioned that earlier figure about non-store uh, retailing being uh, uh, three to four percent of a of a two trillion dollar economy in 1992. Now it's more than 10 percent of a five trillion dollar retail economy. It has grown from a 60 billion dollar industry to a 500 billion dollar industry, and that rate of transfer from physical stores to digital retailing is accelerating. This is a chart from the, uh, from the US Commerce Department that shows that e-commerce is growing on a quarterly adjusted basis three to seven times faster than the total retail economy. If you get underneath that, it means all the growth is happening in e-tail channels. What this really means, well, it could look dire if you are an incumbent brand, what it actually means is the entire economy is opening up to new entrants and new challenges. And it is happening in category after category after category. You see the same truth underlying it. For example, in razors in the United States, Gillette's share of the market 
Gillette, Procter & Gamble spent, I think, $40 billion for Gillette mm, 10, 15 years ago. Um, Gillette has lost 16 share points in six years. All of those share points, all of that market share has gone to these competitors like Harry's and Dollar Shave Club that are delivering directly to the home. In contact lenses, and healthcare is actually a fast-growing category, you have category leaders like AccuView and Bausch & Lomb that are growing reasonably well, 8%, 6%. But a new entrant that delivers directly to the home, works directly with consumers, Hubble Contacts, is growing 20% a month. The same thing is happening in pet food, where you have modest growth, it exceeds uh, GDP, so 4.4% um, in 2018 is projected, but you have a subscription service, the farmer's dog, that is averaging 40 to 50% revenue growth per month. In mattresses, you have dozens of companies across every geography that are just trouncing the long-term long global incumbents, Sealy, Posturepedic, and Tempurpedic. In fact, they are suffering so much, they're merging in order to preserve their scale. But uh, meanwhile, these direct-to-consumer brands doubled their share last year from 5 to 10%. In shoes, U.S. shoe stores are the biggest category of retail wipeout of the 9,000 stores that closed in the United States last year. The number one category of closures was shoe stores. Uh, sales, as you can tell, fell uh, 5% uh, between the beginning of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. Meanwhile, online-only shoe companies gained nearly 15 percentage points over, uh, 15 points of share over uh, the past five years. Grocery stores, grocery store revenue is flat, about 1% annually uh, projected. Meal kits are expected to grow 10x, 10 times in revenue during that period. And just to kind of let you understand that this is not merely about direct delivery to the home, this is about the ability of small companies to enter the marketplace. Look at what's happening to consumer products in the United States. There is a massive shift away from the large consumer products companies towards small and medium sized uh, companies. Whether they're selling uh, direct to consumer or whether they're selling in the store, they just have a greater ability to get financing, to create the product, and to get into the home. So what's actually going on here? The way I like to think of it is that there are three last miles that need to be closed. And technology is closing all three of these last miles. There's the last mile to the home, the way products are created, uh, the way they get to you, the way you buy them. But there's also the last mile to the head, the delivery of a rational um, uh, offer. Um, and there's the last mile to the heart, the delivery of an emotional uh, offer as well. These are the things that advertising and marketing have traditionally done over the years. But what's changing is the cloud. There's a single technology. It is the cloud that is closing all three of these last miles. The physical last mile of product creation and distribution, and the intellectual last mile of uh, delivering an offer, and the emotional last mile. The cloud is the technology that's bringing all these things together. You, you have to, th the cloud is, it's the way to think about it, it's like the mechanical loom was in the 18th century. It changes the geographic scale and scope of human endeavors. The cloud is really a, a great connector. This is a J.D. Power study from about a year ago. It says that two-thirds of consumers today expect to be able to speak directly to brands. And equally important, two-thirds of consumers are acting on that expectation. They are communicating directly to brands through digital technologies. Keep in mind that visual I showed you before. Brands had no physical connection to their end consumers. None. Consumers had no direct connection to their brands. And yet today, 2018, consumers believe that this is a right. Not just an expectation, but a right that they can connect directly to brands. Uh, brands get something equally valuable in return for those connections to consumers. They get first-party data that fuels every other function of the enterprise. That voluntarily provided first-party data comes in, and it helps companies understand, oh, what new products should I develop? 
What new services should I develop? What, what new things should I do about pricing? How do I identify who my best consumers are and what pricing advantages I might give them? It even helps you develop real-time pricing mechanisms. This is really the way to uh, think about e-tailing. It's not just about consumer convenience. It's uh, not just about data. It's not just about uh, creating a sale. It's about all of those things wrapped together. The shift from physical retailing to digital retailing creates a different form of company. It creates an enriched enterprise in which the core asset is the data itself. What's notable about this cloud-centered industrial revolution, also extraordinarily important, is every bit of it is for rent. That high barrier to entry supply chain, where you needed to own every function in order to lock out your competition and secure your advantage for decades at a time, well, virtually every bit of it can now be rented or leased off the shelf. The value of scale that used to be the, the, the true power of great consumer-facing brands, the value of scale is eroding as companies can go onto the web and rent sourcing, rent logistics, rent distribution. In fact, this is now being called supply chain as a service. This is from a McKinsey report. You don't need to own it in order to get into the marketplace. Here's an easy way to understand this. Uh, if 25 years ago, you had an idea for a, uh, a better toothpaste. Towny Fian, where are you? You're here somewhere. If Towny Fian had an idea for a better toothpaste, there is nothing she could do with that idea. She can't get access to the raw materials. If she could find the raw materials, she can't afford to buy them because they're only available by the ton. If she managed to be able to buy a ton of sodium bicarbonate and mint, she couldn't do anything with it because there's no factory anywhere in the world that would give her any time or space on the factory line. If somehow she managed to create a couple tubes of toothpaste in her bathtub, she couldn't do anything with it because she couldn't afford to distribute it because small batch distribution is too expensive. And if you manage to distribute it, nobody would stock you because you can't afford to drive demand because demand driving takes enormous expense to get onto primetime television or national magazines. Now, if Townie had that idea for a better toothpaste, she could just lease or rent the resources to get it delivered. There are dozens of direct-to-consumer toothpaste companies in the world now. There, in fact, there's so many of them, they're able to segment by specialty. There's a health segment. There's a subscription se segment. You can subscribe to have your toothpaste delivered once a week or twice a month. My favorite is this company called Brandless, which was founded by a former board member of IEB US, Tina Sharkey, which is actually trying to create a brand out of direct delivered unbranded products. It's basically taking, creating a brand out of a white label. And there are dozens of these all over the world. Um, as the costs of entry plummet, we're also finding a fragmentation, not just in the consumer companies themselves, but in the way that things are being sold. It's wrong to look at this. It's wrong to look at this as a contest between e-tailing on the one hand and physical retailing on the other hand. There are maybe a dozen, maybe a score of different kinds of formats that are becoming dominant that are actually combinations of physical and virtual retailing. There's um, uh, flash selling, of course, uh, and you have companies that specialize in doing flash selling formats. Uh, you've got personal curation. You have uh, big retailers like uh, Walmart buying virtual brands like Bonobos. Walmart's actually uh, bought about a dozen of these. So you have a lot, of, a lot of this happening around the world. But what's central to all of it, the entire movement here is, again, towards the ownership of the data, 
creating a personal relationship between the brand and the consumer and realizing that relationship through the uh, continue, continued enrichment of the relationship and the realization uh, through data. We've got new media formats that are also proliferating. This difficult to read uh, graphic shows what's happening in the over-the-top television marketplace, uh, the streaming marketplace in the US and around the world. Different competitors, some are device-based, some are platform-based, some are network-based, some are streaming-based. What's important about all of them is that these companies actually appeal to a new demographic. And I can tell you what this chart says very, very, very quickly. Uh, it says that consumers of original streaming digital video content are twice as likely as the general video uh, population to consider new direct-to-consumer brands. So you actually have a new medium being developed in streaming video that is being heavily utilized by these new direct-to-consumer brands to appeal to a new audience. Another way to think about it is we have left the era of mass brands that get to consumers through mass retail stores and communicate to those consumers through mass media to a new era where it's very easy to create semi-customized brands and products to deliver those directly to consumer segments that are interested in them and to market them or advertise them through customized or semi-customized media. These uh, disruptor brands are obviously uh, designed to be communicated on social media. Glossier is really the, uh, uh, is one of the great cosmetics brands of this uh, new era. And it says it owes 90% of its revenues to its Instagram fans. If you don't know about Glossier, one important fact, it started as a blog. It was a blog first done by a former journalist who realized that she could create the cosmetics of her dreams. Kind of like Townie's toothpaste, except Townie, you didn't do it, and Emily Weiss did do it. So let me give you a description. Let me give you an easy way to think about this. The next slide is the slide you're going to want to photograph. I showed you this one already. We've lived for almost 140 years, as I said, in what we call the indirect brand economy, beginning with Procter & Gamble and Ivory Soap. And that was characterized by a high barrier to entry, owned and operated, capital-intensive supply chain, with value extraction done through these very opaque, difficult third-party handoffs. Well, if that was the indirect brand economy, what succeeds it? It's what we call the direct brand economy. We date it to 2010. That's the year Warby Parker was founded. In the direct brand economy, value is created not through an owned and operated capital-intensive supply chain, but it's created through the uh, through an open source leased or rented supply chain, which exists, we think, in four stacks. And we've deliberately chosen the language of the ad tech stack to describe this, because the ad tech stack, as you know, implies promiscuous availability. You can rent it, you can lease the capability, you can insource it if you want. It's up to you, based on what your strategic priorities are. And value is extracted not through a series of third-party handoffs, but it's extracted through the direct relationship between the brand and the consumer. This is what the new consumer economy looks like. As I said before, as I promised I would show you, it is a global phenomenon. It is not limited uh, simply to, uh, to the US. Uh, there are brands like uh, Lisa in the UK, which is the Casper of, um, of, of England, ca uh, mattresses. You have uh, some categories like menu boxes, which the US believes it invented, but in fact, the menu box service was invented in Sweden. Um, you've got Chinese companies coming into these marketplaces. You have, uh, uh, you have Warby Parker lookalikes all around the world. I think here in Italy, the, uh, the main direct-to-consumer direct brand is called uh, Quattrocento. Uh, anybody wearing Quattrocento uh, eyeglasses in the room? Okay, well, it's a Warby Parker, Warby Parker look-alike 
But every category, every category has its analogs in many countries around the world. These indirect brands are really nipping at the heels of the big brands. The big brands recognize what's going on. This is an illustration of 45, 45 direct brands that are attacking every single one of Procter and Gamble's uh, uh, categories. In fact, it was such a significant attack that this was one of the reasons uh, the hedge fund, Tryon Partners, tried to throw out Procter and Gamble's management because it wasn't paying enough attention to the direct brands that are attacking it. Some brands uh, are, in fact, competing very well. You have Nike, whose uh, direct-to-consumer sales, uh, uh, it expects, are going to uh, triple within the, uh, within, the next, uh, within the next year. It's a five-year plan to get from $6.5 billion of direct consumer sales to uh, $20 billion of, uh, I'm sorry, $16 billion of direct consumer sales. Nike realized years ago, I know I need to get off, right? Uh, Nike realized years ago that if it tethered itself to physical stores, it would die. And so it's been in a long-term uh, transition. You have companies like Unilever, which have also recognized this uh, very well. Unilever bought Dollar Shave Club. When it bought Dollar Shave Club, the CEO, Paul Pullman, explicitly said it was doing this in order to, um, uh, in order to infuse the rest of the organization with these direct consumer capabilities. But most brands are not participating in this new economy. This is the competitive Downside and competitive upside. As you can see, you've got 38% of the top 100 brands that aren't selling anything directly to their end consumers. So what does this mean in terms of strategy? I just want to give you a couple lessons to take back with you. Uh, one, strategy number one, for every brand and every company that serves brands, you have to think direct. This is the only strategy in the world. The future of business is in creating direct relationships with your end consumers. Doesn't mean you have to sell everything directly to them, but you need to have a significant chunk of these direct relationships because that is the competitive advantage of any one company over the other, is the volume and the enrich enrichedness of its direct consumer relationships. What that also means, and this is extraordinarily important for every publisher in this room, a two-way relationship is definitively more valuable than a one-way impression. Why? Because a two-way relationship brings you voluntarily provided data. And that informs every other function in your company. Another lesson from the direct brand economy, the only metric that matters is performance. We talk and talk and talk and we debate and debate and debate about advertising metrics and what metrics are we going to do and how are we going to reach consensus over things like viewability and whatnot. And I'm here to tell you that that matters every day less and less and less because these companies are managing themselves on the basis of what did I sell, to whom, and am I maintaining that relationship? So everything is trending towards what we have called performance. The distinctions between performance and brand are breaking down. It also means that brand safety is not optional. It's a necessity. Why? It has nothing to do with this vague notion of, of reputation. Who cares about reputation? This is about data. You need trust in order to get data. Because without trust, there is no data, and without data, there is no company. You don't have a company, you don't have a choice here. Another lesson from the direct brands is that story matters. This is not just about programmatic delivery of banner after banner after banner after banner. They differentiate themselves on the basis of storytelling. That is part of the way they go to market. I mentioned that Glossier started as a blog. Every single one of these companies on that list I showed you up front differentiates itself on the basis of content and content marketing. Uh, the second to last lesson is you've got to go omni and get hybrid. The, uh, there is no such thing anymore 
as simply selling only through the third-party retail store. You have to be able to sell physically and you have to be able to sell virtually in order to grow. Without virtual selling, there is no data. Without data, you don't have a future. But physical presence is becoming increasingly important as a differentiator as well. And finally, the last lesson is you need to get a 3D view of your one-dimensional customer. Any direct brand that's selling is going to be constrained by the fact that it only knows its consumers, primarily knows its consumers, as consumers of its product. The thing that great publishers have always done and great advertising agencies and other great uh, support companies for brands is they help the brands get a 360 degree view of their consumers. The better, the better to be able to create content for them, the better to be able to understand what kinds of products they want, the better to be able to sell products to them and create a lifetime customer relationship. Uh, last word. At IEB in the US, we find this research so powerful that we are reorienting the entire organization around what we call the direct brand revolution. We think that this uh, is the future of everything in our business. So we are doing our very first direct brands conference at the uh, end of October. Uh, we are taking this study. By the way, this study the, is 180 pages long. If you go onto the IBUS website, you can find your way to it. Uh, there's a great deal more detail in there, as you might imagine. We're going to uh, redo the study and update it every year. Uh, we're going to update our uh, research into the top 250 uh, direct brands and start doing more and more around case studies. Um, I thank you for your time. Uh, I do hope you download the 180-page study. I swear to God, it is your future. Thank you very much.